Uh, it's Monday morning. There's no better thing to do than look at robot movies. And so I saw, I know Andy gave you the, showed you the big dog movie, but we're going to talk more generally about robotics today. Um, I'd like to introduce you to some general concepts, uh, show lots of movies. I think they're useful for teaching purposes. They can, when you go back to the classroom, it's a, it's a great tool. Uh, and then focus just a little bit, but not very technically, on some of our recent work on fish, uh, fish robots just to give you a little bit more depth in one uh, area that's very different from the terrestrial environment that you saw uh, with Andy and uh, with uh, Professor Lieberman. So the area of robotics, I think, is a great new sort of direction for studies of anatomy and physiology. I think if you think of something like the human arm, we've known about the structure of the bones, the muscles that control the arm for hundreds, to some extent thousands of years. Um, when you teach the structure of the arm, you're not teaching anything that's really new. But it's easy to, even though anatomy and physiology really excite students, I think, in general, uh, just because of the intrinsic interest in our own bodies, there are a lot of new applications of knowledge of anatomy and physiology. And robotics is one of those. Um, you see it in the news you know, every day, almost. There are new robots. New York Times had something, I think, on Sunday on J Japanese robots are in trouble now. Um, I don't know what that exactly meant. But, um, uh, there's, you see a lot more about robotics. And so I'd like to sort of just give us some general, this is a very famous robot from Cynthia Brazil's lab at uh, MIT, the Kismet Sociable Robot. Sociable robots are a big new uh, area. She really started the field. Um, and there are two terms that you may have heard or may have heard uh, Professor uh, Biewiner talk about a little bit. The term of biorobotics, which is just sort of using biological inspiration to build robots. They, they could be humanoid robots or they could be animal-based robots. Um, which we'll talk uh, a lot more about today. You may have also heard the term biomimetics. Um, is that familiar to any of you? Using biological design and imitating or mimicking biological design to do, build robotic platforms. And the, the, there's a journal called the Journal of Biomimetics, which is all about building sort of animal-inspired, robots inspired from nature. Some of them actually do come from plants. So, uh, that term is a bit, people are in, in the field are a bit concerned about it because we often don't try to mimic nature. We try and learn the principles by which nature does things and apply them to robots because we can use stainless steel, we can use springs, we can use materials that nature doesn't have. And in some cases, those materials are better. Nature isn't always better, in, in part because animals are often compromises between different functions. Animals have to do many things but we can build very task-oriented robots to go find someone in a pile of rubble. You don't need to have the robot be able to reproduce, find mates, you know, navigate <laughs> through the world in other ways. You can build a very task-oriented robot. So sometimes it's useful to learn by studying snake locomotion, for example, how you might build a slithering robot with microphones to find people in earthquake rubble, but you don't have to do other things the snake does. So we're not trying actually necessarily always to imitate or mimic nature but it's kind of a catch-all phrase for the, a new approach to, to robotics. Um, the field of robotics, is, it's a bit like I think nanotechnology is now. You, in, the, you know, in the 50s and 60s, we all thought we'd be driving robot cars down the freeways, that robots would be cleaning our houses, that you know, we'd wake up in the morning, the robots would be serving us you know, our morning breakfast. And Astro Boy, I don't know if uh, the, many of you are younger than I am in here, but the old Astro Boy, Atom Boy cartoon was very uh, popular, a Japanese cartoon where we had a robot boy with sort of atomic energy built in, completely designed to do uh, fight evildoers and things like that. Um, and there was a tremendous promise of robotics. And then it kind of went away for a while while people really tried to you know, develop better materials, better understanding of how to move robots around. And we certainly haven't gotten to this point yet, but I do think we're on the threshold now of a revolution in robots that's um, evidenced not just by the vacuum cleaners, the Roomba vacuum cleaner that cleans your carpet, but you know, in, in Iraq we have lots of bomb disposal robots. We've got robots being used to help people uh, assist humans, um, especially uh, elderly people. There's a big field of robotic assistance for humans, um, aquatic robots for climbing things, and you'll see uh, lots of other types of robots today. Um, so I think, like nanotechnology, there was this big burst of interest and everyone thought we'd all be nano everything and then it all kind of died away. And now there's actually real research coming out and we'll see it in the next 20 or 30 years. I think we're at that point with robotics. It's all starting to, to happen now. So what I want to do is just talk a little bit about robotics in the next 45 minutes or so. 
Um, I do think that sort of using robotics as a way of teaching about anatomy and physiology, of an application for anatomy and physiology, it's a great, uh, great approach to take. And there's a lot of inspiration that we're getting uh, from animals. There are lots of new ways of moving robots that are still very much in the laboratory. I'll show you one of those. One of the big challenges of robotics is how to move things. Because you can certainly in the lab put big motors and uh, you know, air actuated pistons and things in. But if you want a robot to be able to run around in the wild, uh, that's a problem. And so new ways of controlling and moving uh, the term the the term in the field is an actuator, something that actuates the motion. And these contractile polymers, contractile plastics are one way of, of doing that. I'll show you a few movies. And then controlling the robot is really important, sort of making a robot brain. It's a huge challenge and a huge problem. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about that um, in a moment. So here, let's start with robot movies on Monday morning. Um, uh, you, most of you have probably seen the Asimo robot from, from Honda. Um, you know, it started out uh, kind of, uh, you know, there's a little man walking around here. Uh, the next generation looks a little better. Now they've got multiple Asimos serving tea to people um, uh, at a table. But what you don't see here, and this relates to what I was just saying about the control, what you don't see is the huge tractor trailer off stage with multiple people moving joysticks and 10 banks of computers <laughs> controlling the robot. So those of us in the field of biological robotics think this is ridiculous because this is exactly how nature doesn't do things. Nature has very simple control mechanisms that move animals. And they're very redundant. And they're very simple, actually, in the grand scheme of things. Figuring out the brain is not simple. But the basic control systems are very simple. This is a highly over-controlled robot. And they had to do that to make it sort of look reasonable. So in some ways, this is a, a sign that we have a long way to go in understanding what animals have done to move around and making the human robot that actually looks, looks good. Um, there's some spooky stuff coming down the line. These sort of human facial, these are the, the sort of the new generation of the sociable robots. It looks like something from Star Trek, the next generation. You, know, you take off the back of the head and there are a bunch of wires in there. There's a lot of stuff going on. I can only really hint at it. But if you're teaching and want to use any of this, you, know, you can find these pictures. If you Google search for robot you know, human brain, you'll see all sorts of stuff like this. The robot arms are very hard to build, but they're making a lot of progress. And so I think in the next a couple of you know, years, five to 10 years, you'll see really useful robot arms and hands. And there are even some semi-useful ones now that people are actually wearing, but that could really provide some functional replacement uh, with some uh, delicacy and ability to control things. So it's, uh, I think the field is sitting right on the cusp. Maybe in the future, you'll be able to order on Amazon your replacement hand and, and plug it in. I mentioned. Um, how you power these robots. And that's a huge issue. Batteries are still not very good. Um, powering these things with batteries is challenging. Uh, they do it. There are various hydraulic actuators that people use to power robots. Um, and here's sort of a new approach. I'll show you a little more about this in a second. But here's a sort of a skeleton hand that's powered by contractile polymers, which are these black strips you see on the back of this 3D printed. These are little plastic. Uh, hand-like elements. And I'll show you more about these and tell you more about them in a second. But these are strips of a layered plastic, actually, that you can take a simple 9-volt battery and causes the plastic to swell and contract and bend. And that's something that's very low power. The technology of making the plastic is still very actively underdeveloped. This whole role of artificial muscles, uh, Scientific American had an article on it a couple of years ago on powering motion in robotic devices with artificial muscle. So I think that's another key area that there need to be a lot of uh, advances. Now these artificial muscles look like this. These contractile polymers have three layers, typically. So they're called tri-layers. And there's a gel in the middle that's got electrolytes sort of a salt solution in it. And when you apply a voltage, the salts move into one side or the other, depending on what you applied the voltage for. And if those ions move into one side, it causes it to swell. And as one side swells, it will bend to one side or the other, depending on which side you, you use. So here's our little tri-layer with the tan-shaped uh, electrolyte gel in the center. And if we put a negative voltage on this side, this thing contracts. The positive voltage causes the ions to move into the positive 
the charged side and it swells and bends. And when you reverse the voltage, it bends to the opposite side. So here's a little trilayer of a polyparole polymer. And we can uh, just play the movie. And you're going to see a light light up when there's a positive voltage on that side. And you can see this thing bend back and forth. Real time? Um, that is actually pretty much real time. That's a good question. Sometimes I'll, I'll show you a movie in a little bit from a fish fin that took about a minute to bend up. But this is real time. There are issues. The, the, there are various issues with this, these materials. And so there's just a lot of research um, to improve them. We can talk more about that uh, if you'd like. But this is definitely going to have to be some sort of a future. Now, in contrast to the Honda robot Asimo, there are some very simple robots that people are working on to understand the principles of robotics. So this is an entirely passive robot. I don't know if Professor Bewinner showed you the, <laughs> the passive walking robots. But this is, was built at MIT. There are a number of groups working on it. Here's a treadmill. This robot has no actuation at all. It's entirely passive. And the treadmill is slightly declined. So you're using the gravitational energy. And you've designed, the robot's been designed so that with just a slight decline, all the masses of the limbs, the positions of the joints, it actually was a tremendous effort to have just a passive walking robot. So this robot's on a slight decline. There's a controller. And it kind of lurches back and forth and learns to walk forward. This is the opposite of the Asimo robot. There's no brain in this thing at all. And that's one of the important principles that animal uh, researchers of animal studies have, have been able to extract from nature, is that often you can get a very reasonable behavior with very minimal control. Um, and you, the Asimo robot is, uh, is ridiculous. Now, if we go beyond the human world, you saw the big dog robot, but there are many of us. And uh, Professor Bewinner does some work in this area. We do a lot of work in the aquatic realm, many of us working in a flight and flying robots, a swimming robots, running robots, or taking inspiration from nature to build animal-like robotic devices. That's what we do um, in my lab. And we can look at some examples. This is actually a really great robot, and they've made a lot of progress since then. This is a climbing robot, the RISE climbing robot. And it's based on, a, on the gecko. Some of you may have seen in the news. There's lots of news about uh, gecko feet and adhesion and you know, new Scott, new band-aids that have gecko hair, like hairs on them and things like that. But it's going up. I mean, these are really well done. And the people who work on this have done a fantastic job. Um, some of your tax dollars via the military have gone into producing these robots. But um, they will have a tremendous impact when they can, you know, in the future, they'll be getting cats out of trees and all these things. But, <laughs> but, but for now, we're, we're still trying to understand the principles. And so very, the, the work that's been done on, on climbing is really how animals do this, those principles were absolutely applied to, this, uh, to these robots. So yeah, there's nothing better than robot movies. <laughs> that, oh, that is certainly controlled, absolutely. There's a sort of a built-in program that drives that. Yeah, and actually how the limbs, are, the limbs are pulling in and how the tail's balancing, that's all very much inspired by animals. And that, th this does have control. Yeah, I think to go vertically, you have to have some control. And here's a uh, little you know, simple salamander uh, robot that's going to go into the water. So there's been interest in how animals navigate from one type of environment to another. So this is actually very much controlled. There's a sort of an important paper on how to control the segments and move them in the right way and have it switch between moving on land and moving in the water. Um, and we can now turn to some fish robots, which is going to begin our transition to some of the a few more technical things that we've done in the lab. Some of these robots are really good. Some of them are not so good. So here's a, I would have to say, sadly, not so good. So you have little paddles kind of beating up and down. And the whole thing is lurching back and forth. And it's kind of sad. But um, uh, the, some of the robots are actually r really good. And this is the University of Essex. Um, they built this robot to uh, sit in an aquarium in the London Aquarium and uh, to learn some things about robotics. And uh, this is a very well done fish robot. And it kind of beats back and forth. There are a few tricks. I can see what the tricks they've done are. But um, it's got a very natural motion. It turns. It sort of you know, avoids things more or less. Uh, it's very smooth, easy motion uh, for a swimming fish. What do you mean by tricks? 
Well, one of the things they've done is they've used an unpowered turn. So it's going to turn, and all they do to make a very natural turn is they just bend the body and they hold it. So right there. Looks really good, but it was very simple for them to do. Um, and if they had fish had to do this and actually navigate through the environment, it would have a problem. But this is, um, you know, it's a good step. We're a long way away. Here's a, a robo manta ray from uh, loosely, using the term loosely, from Japan. It flaps up and down. Um, again, these are, we're at the early stage of these, these robots, but there's a, a lot that can be learned. Have students in my lab are working on the, the wing structure of, the, of rays and how they actually move it. Um, and I'll tell you some things about fish fins in, in a little bit, design principles of fish fins. Now, this is the only, I would say, really commercial application of sort of fish robotic technology. And I don't know whether any of you have seen this, but the Hobie people, Hobie kayak, Hobie catamarans who make these uh, ocean going or near shore vessels, people uh, like to kayak around. You can buy Hobie kayaks, they're like old town kayaks. They make a kayak called the Mirage kayak. And it's really popular with bird watchers because it's hands free. So you can see this person is pedaling, has his feet on these pedals. You move the pedals back and forth, and it moves. There's a, this shaft that goes through the center of your kayak, and out the bottom are these paddles. And they're moved in sort of a fish fin like manner. We can see what this looks like here. Underneath the kayak, these flapping paddles move back and forth. I actually bought one of these, it's in my office. Uh, a few feet down the road there. And so that's the Mirage Drive by Hobie. And uh, people can cruise around and bird watch and not have to paddle with their hands. Um, and apparently they're, they're pretty popular. So this kind of flapping propulsion system is very different than propellers. Right? That's a, the most human-based aquatic locomotion is propeller-based. So let's transition to the fish world and ask why fish robots? And, that really gets at this question, or gets at the issue of the propellers. We've developed so much propeller-based technology for aquatic locomotion, and lots of people have realized fish swim very well, and they're quiet, and you could explore coral reefs and not have propellers going whirring around and scaring all the fish off, which is what you're sort of trying to observe. So most human designs have very large stable vehicles. Um, rigid components, noisy gears, the noise is very uh, high from these propellers when they spin. Um, they make lots of noise. The Navy hates that, but animals hate it too. Um, they have very limited maneuverability. If you want to turn a submarine, you know, it, I mean, nuclear submarines take a half a mile to turn around. Um, we could do better, I think, <laughs> if we take some inspiration from nature and try to move beyond current technology. And one way to do that is to sort of look at fishes as robotic, as inspiration for aquatic robots. And the, one of the key things about fishes, they're flexible. I think all of you who have eaten a fish, which I presume is most people, if you pick the fish up off your plate, I realize it's dead, but it's floppy. And live fish are really floppy. They're floppy and they're gooey. And um, they're nothing if not flexible. And that's the opposite of what, uh, how you would design a, a rigid hulled vehicle. Um, they use multiple control surfaces, another bit of a jargony term, but basically it means things that put move fluid. So fins, think fins for control surfaces. Um, and they use adaptive surfaces, surfaces that can change in shape. Um, and uh, another interesting thing about fish that you'll see in a moment is fish are actually unstable. So in a, in a submarine or a boat, you have the, the center of mass is usually below the center of buoyancy so that they are stable, so that you, have, you don't uh, tip over, but fish are actually designed to be unstable, designed in the evolutionary sense. I don't mean that they were created to be unstable. Um, are, they are unstable, and that makes them more maneuverable. So if you think of a, a stealth aircraft, which is highly maneuverable, but very unstable. It's so unstable it has to be computer controlled. It can't be flown just by a person. And they're powered with the sort of non-gear based mechanisms. There are no batteries. There are no noisy motors. It's all very quiet. So if we ever could make a fish-based aquatic robot powered by artificial muscles, we could do a lot of observation on coral reefs without uh, scaring the, the fish off. And so we're hoping eventually to build a new generation of vehicles. And what I'm going to show you is not a bunch of aquatic vehicles, because we're actually doing in my lab the basic science that's required to understand how to build the aquatic vehicle. So we do have some robotic devices that you'll see, but not in any whole fish robots uh, yet. Yeah? 
If fish are um, evolutionarily designed to be unstable, why are they so stable? Because they're very good at controlling their movements. And you'll see that actually in just a slide. Hang on, that's a very good question. They are unstable, but they maintain stability actively all the time by keeping themselves upright. In a way, it's like you. I mean, I'm stable standing here, but if you instantly anesthetize me, I wouldn't be stable for that long because any small perturbation would knock me over. I'm actively contracting my muscles just to stay stable. Fish are like that too, or like riding a bicycle. Right. It's a control issue. You're constantly having to work to stay upright. Not a lot, but to some extent. And that's the, you've identified really the downside of it is that if you're designed to be unstable, it's, it requires energy constantly to, to stay stable. And uh, whereas if you design something to be very stable, it can just sit there, but then it can't maneuver very well. So there's that trade-off. And there's a big trade-off, certainly, in the evolution of fishes between stability and maneuverability. In fish, these are the control surfaces. Here's a fish. There are lots of different ones. Here's the dorsal fin on the top of the fish. The caudal fin is the tail, sort of out of focus back there. Here's the pectoral fin of a fish. And so these very flexible fin control surfaces are what we've been working on with the idea that, especially for small ex exploratory devices, instead of you could take all the propellers off and stick the fins out the, uh, the sides of this thing and flap them back and forth, control them, and use them to maneuver in a uh, controlled and quiet uh, way. Um, and I'll say uh, a lot more about this for the, over the next uh, 20 minutes or so. We'll sort of focus on fish. For now, just notice that here's a fish fin. There are these individual elements that come out that branch. You can see them branching. There's actually a membrane in between. It's like a saran wrap, very translucent, thin membrane. You can think of it very much like your, your fingers. Actually, I'll show you slides in a moment that show the structure. But each one of these structures actually has lots of small bones. So you can think of it like a hand with a membrane between your finger that they can kind of curl and move and expand uh, and compress. And you'll see the, the structure in a moment. It's got a, an amazing uh, structure. I think it's unique as far as I can tell. But these fins, I'm sure you've all seen fish in aquaria or you know, whatever. And uh, they can move all these fins. They have many different fins. These are the pelvic fins that, they're con that are sort of constantly in motion to support themselves. So here's a fish taken in my lab, actually, this little movie, just sitting still in the water. So let's look at. There's no current. It's just hovering. So this gets at your question, too. It's hovering, but you can see it's constantly using its fins just to stay. Now, I'll just say it's really hard to get a robot to do this. <laughs> fish is no problem. I can walk into my lab any time of night or day, and the fish is hovering beautifully. And just to make a robot do that, it's, that's really hard. So we have a, we've had five years of funding from the Navy. We've got three more years now to basically build a robot that can do this. And if you shoot a jet of water, it can correct itself and stay upright. Nobody has built a robot that can do this yet. Is there a question? Yeah. Um, is he moving his fins just to stay upright, or does he also need to move the water so that he can breathe? Um, good question. No, the breathing is completely independent. So he's using his fins just to stay upright and to stay in one place. So if most fish are slightly negatively buoyant, so he would slowly sink to the bottom. So he's using his fins to stay upright, stay up in the water column, and to stay vertical. So if you anesthetize this fish, this is one of what I mean by unstable. If you anesthetize that fish, it will turn upside down, and it will sink to the bottom. That's bad if you're a robot. Now let's look at this other fish, which is going to just turn slightly. And I'll just point out, so they do need constant fin motion. And they are negatively buoyant, so they would sink to the bottom. And the center of buoyancy is below the center of mass. So Center of buoyancy is, say, my right hand center of mass is up here. So that, that produces a, a turning moment, which will, the fish will flip over if it um, was anesthetized. And so here's a fish just turning, sort of slowly using its pectoral fin, some of its tail fin to kind of flip itself around. This is sort of a zero radius turn, right? It's just sort of spinning on its long axis. It's really hard to get robots to do that. People have propellers everywhere. They're whirring and spinning the thing around. And that's how you do it. It takes a lot of energy because uh, they're not flexible, to just spin. So then would the goal be to make the robot flexible? I think our first goal, making flexible robots is very hard, making them watertight. So I think our first goal is to take a rigid hull and attach flexible, controllable fish fins of a design that you'll see in a few moments to that. 
So let's get the fins to, to work correctly on a rigid hull and then move to a, a flexible hull. So I think it's a while before you're going to see flexible hulled vehicles. Making them watertight and bend is very hard. If you flood them, then you have to make all the components watertight and anything you would want to put in there that's a, would be a problem. Well, so. wouldn't you have described the, was it a salamander that went from terrestrial to aquatic? Mm -hmm. That's very flexible, that's right. And we've done actually a lot of work on sort of on the flexible bending motion of fish bodies. I won't tell you about that today, but um, we, we've, we had to make a decision sort of early on in the sort of bio-robotics field. You have to think and you have to decide what direction am I going to go, and we decide to stay away from bending bodies and trying to make them you know, taking a few years to make them waterproof. Let's understand the fins, attach them, see what kind of performance we can get from that, and then if we need to, we'll go to flexible bodies. Right. I'll probably be retired by then. <laughs> and the next generation, my students can solve that problem, and I'll be on the beach in California. <laughs> Let's look at the motion of the fins, because the motion is amazing, actually. It's spectacular. So we've taken a series of high-speed videos of fish swimming, and I have a sort of a fish treadmill in my lab where the water goes around in a circle and the fish swims against that current so we can get them to hold position. And I'm going to get out of PowerPoint here um, to show you a higher resolution movie um, of this motion. So as you can probably anticipate, we're looking from behind the fish. So we had mirror in the flow. And so the fish is actually would be swimming away from you except that it's swimming against a current. So it's going to stay in exactly the same place. And it's going to swim actually only with its pectoral fins. So I'll start this and then we'll zoom in on it. So it's going to beat just with its fins and hold position in the flow. It's got a few flapping of its tail fin, but it can generate all the propulsive force it needs just with its pectoral fins. And so if we zoom in on that, see, I love this movie, but I'm a little biased. But you can see how flexible the fins are. It should repeat. You can see that everything's bending and twisting. Um, you can see the, how the fish is controlling the rays. I'll say more about this in a little bit. Um, all the work on robotic insect wings treats sort of the wings, and it's not unreasonable as a little flat, flat plate where the wings beat back and forth like this. But you can see as these fins come out, they're, they're cupping. They're, curving. So you have a lower edge and an upper edge that are actively moved out into um, the fluid. But are they actually trying to control the bending of it, or is that just passive against the resistance of the water? It's actually both, and I'll speak uh, just in a few seconds about the bending, because the bending is actually really important. Okay. And I'll show you what, uh, what's going on. Here's one more movie uh, from another view from below of a fish swimming with its pectoral fins here, and I'll zoom way in so you can see the motion of these individual fin, finger-like fin ray supports, the bone-like fin ray supports. And again, you can see the upper edge there. We're looking from below the fish, and you can see how steadily it's swimming, and it's just beating its, its pectoral fins. And even the other fish, you're not seeing it sort of lurch forward and lurch back. It's a very smooth motion, and actually that turned out to be um, important. Now let's look at the fin rays, at the structure of the fin. So here's our fin. We're going to look in this box region here, and this is what you would see. You would see red, which is the bone. So I've stained the bone red. So each one of these long elements here is one of these fin rays going out the fin. You can sort of see the folded membrane scrunched up in between. It's like a fan that can be expanded and compressed. And you can see these little jointed segments, we can zoom in on one of these here, blow it up so you see these little bony segments. You can think of them like the segments of your hand, if you like, and the membrane that's in between that can push on the fluid. But there's one thing that's really different that gets at your, your bending question that's really uh, different about the design of fish fins compared to um, your, your hand. And let's look at this. So each, let me go back for a second, each one of these rays here. Actually, in addition to being bony and having these little segments, has two halves to it. And 
each half ray, half fin ray, they're attached at the end. They come down, and there are muscles that pull on them at the bottom. And actually, there are four muscles on each fin ray. Each pectoral fin has 14 fin rays. So there are, there are plus a few muscles that I've left out. There are about 60 muscles that control each fin. So that's a lot. hope I don't have to program those motions myself. But there's a very important design feature of this if you think about it. And the model for this is the Ziploc bag. So I've taken a Ziploc bag top. I've chopped off the bag. I've cut it in half. We turn it up, and we have two half Ziplocs. So here's our Ziploc bag, and that's the structure as it compares to a fish fin ray. And when you saw the fin rays before, it would look sort of like that in the fin. So if you zip this up, what this enables the fish to do is through the muscles, which are going to be my fingers, only at the base of the fin, it can bend the fin. This gets at your bending question. So the actual bending you see is a combination of this active and passive. Now, I've looked through the literature for years. <laughs> and I've not found another organism that can do this. And actually, the, there's a, the major radiation of evolutionary radiation of ray fin fishes is about uh, 30,000 species. They've all got this. But sharks don't. Sharks and lungfish and other fish you may be familiar with don't. This is the bony fishes that have this. Insects, you think the insects who have done so um, radiated into every environment on Earth could, would have figured this out. But it's just the fish that got it. And it's tremendously cool. Now, I'm easily amused, so I can do this all day long. <laughs> but I've got a few. You can sort of make these yourself. If you have children at home or your, your students are, act like children, you can amuse them. Um, by uh, showing them this. But it's extremely cool because when you have a fluid load on the fin, so when the fluid is pushing on the fin, the fish can curve into the fluid and resist the loading of the fluid, um, which I don't know of any other organism that can do. So an insect wing, when it's pushed back, when it's pressed on by the air as it's moved, is bent back against that load. It has no way of resisting that actively. And yet it's also very clever. I'm not sure if Professor B. Winner talked about running antelope and things, and the limbs are very reduced to minimize the mass that they have to swing back and forth. It's true, Dan, Professor Lieberman might have talked about our short toes in human evolution. It's thought that our toes are very short because, according to Professor Lieberman, humans evolved in part for running, and that reduces the mass at the end of your leg. You have to swing back and forth all the time. It makes actually a huge difference. So fish have a system where they can bend something without having muscles and adding weight out the fin that they have to then accelerate and decelerate every time. They don't have to do that. All the controls at the base, they can do this. And they don't have to have mass out on the limb. And that's, a, I mean, that's very common in any animals that move appendages back and forth. There's a very high premium on keeping the weight down, keeping the masses at the base, because it's very energetically expensive to flap something. Wouldn't a, um, a wing, a bird wing, do the same? Birds can move their whole wing. They just can't move the feathers. They can't bend the feathers. So you're right. The whole wing could act sort of like the fish fin, but they can't control the feathers and control the aerodynamic load on the feathers. Bat wings are actually the closest probably thing to this. Bat wings in the membrane have muscles, fibers, actually, that can tense the wing. And their fingers, the fingers of the bat, act kind of like fish fin rays. But they don't have the cool bilaminar structure. So I claim fish are much more interesting. <laughs> now, let's look at some robot fins. So I won't go into too many details about this. I'll just kind of give you some uh, examples. Here's a sunfish from our lab. Here's a, one of our robotic fins. I'll show you what this looks like. Again, we're not building whole fin robots. We're trying to understand how the fins generate force on the fluid so that we can then build robotic models. Uh, right now, they're sort of attached to things in the lab, but then they go on to a simple uh, robot that we can um, control in a big tank of water and test. So these are really robotic test platforms as opposed to free swimming robots. And the test platforms are what you need to really understand the science behind aquatic propulsion to then build a fully fledged um, aquatic robot. So this is an example of a, a pectoral fin. This one's now of a yeah, pectoral fin robot, robotic device. This is now a few years old. We've changed the design quite a bit. But what we have, we have fin rays going out here. These actually don't have that bilaminar structure in this fin, but other fins do. Um, so we have fin rays going out here. We take a sewing machine and we sew the lycra membrane. 
that fits over. So here's the membrane of the fin. Um, we have tendons that come down and attach to the base of the fin that go around a block so we can move the fin and control the fin. Um, there's a you know, computer that I'll show you in a few more slides what the lab looks like when we're running these experiments. Um, computer that controls the motion um, of the fin. And we can, we built these, these are sort of a 3D printed block with little holes in it so we can move the tendons from one hole to the next to change the lever arm um, of the system. If we want to change the mechanics of the fin, we can just thread these tendons through different holes and alter the way we make the fin uh, move. And then there's a, there's a fair amount of design engineering that goes into these. My collaborators from Drexel University actually built this one. Um, so we collaborate a lot with MIT, with other, other engineering groups uh, who are doing this. Fish robotics is kind of an, an up and coming thing these days. There are lots of people interested in fish robots. And the way we test this uh, is in my recirculating fish treadmill system. So here's the water. The, when I turn on the motor, the water goes past the fin like that. Here's the fin. And you hopefully see the fin right here. This flat piece of plastic represents the fish body, so I don't care about the fish body right now. I just want to see how the fin moves and generates force. We have a bunch of motors um, that control the fin. The motors are out of the water for this test purpose. And it's on this kind of frictionless air system. I don't know if any of you are physics teachers or you in high school or yourself had these little air tracks where you could send little uh, V-shaped, usually, devices down. There's air being pumped underneath, so it's almost frictionless. This is sort of the high-tech version of that, where there's air coming out here. So the whole thing can slide up and down almost frictionlessly. And as this fin beats back and forth, it kind of swims forward. So the fin itself is just propelling the whole thing. Is that, a, is that reasonably clear? OK. You'll see some flapping fish fin movies. And we actually, one of the great things about robotics from a scientific point of view is you can make the robot fin do anything you want, whereas you can't make the fish do anything you want. <laughs> so you can explore, you know, nature provides cer certain endpoints. And you can't then say, well, if the fish moved its upper part of the fin two centimeters more, well, what would the force be? You can't do that. But once you make the robot fin imitate the fish fin very well, then you can change the program and make the fish fin do what you want. Because it might be true you could do better than the fish can do for certain propulsive tasks. And so this is just to show, convince you, this is from the movie you saw before. This is the fish fin. Here's a view of the robot fin as it beats out and back. We think we did a, whoops, we think we did a pretty good job getting it to imitate the fish fin. But then we do all these experiments where it doesn't do anything fish-like at all and look at the pattern of forces. And I'll talk about that in a second. The other thing we do a lot of, and I won't go into any of the technical parts, I just want to show you some pictures, is we image the flow off the fish fin. So working in the water, we want to know what does the fin do to the fluid. That's how force is generated. It's like when you're swimming, you're pushing on the fluid. And you want to see what that fluid does. It enables you actually to calculate the force and gives you lots of insight into the design of the fin. It's a technically somewhat challenging thing. When you try to measure forces on land, this is what I tell professors Biewiner and Lieberman, they have a very easy research task. <laughs> because when they measure force, they can get you to step on a scale or make their animals step on a force plate. But the force plate doesn't move when they step on it, right? I mean, when you step on the scale, the force plate stays put because you're pressing on the ground. But when the fin or a bird wing pushes on the air or the water, the fluid moves. And so it's actually very hard to measure the force that the fin is pushing on the fluid with. We can do it with force transducers, and we can do it by imaging the flow. So the way we do that is we shine a laser light. So you're seeing a, a laser light sheet here, and I'll show you the movie in a second. We have a very powerful laser, and we shine it into the water, and we seed the water with very small reflective particles that make this kind of speckly pattern. And then we take high-speed videos of that. You'll see this movie in a second to show the fin. I'll show you another one in a moment. Fin uh, deforming the fluid and how the fluid moves around it. They're actually quite, quite beautiful. And then we do thousands and thousands of calculations on these images to extract the flow field, which I won't actually explain. So here's the movie of a very simple beating robotic pectoral fin. Here's the fish body. It's beating through this light sheet made by the laser. And so we're imaging it in this mirror. Let's just look at that one more time. This is a mirror. And 
you just see the speckly weird pattern. It's a little bright in here maybe to see the next movie, but we could give it a shot. I've got one more that might help too. And this is the movie that you would get. So here comes the fan in slow motion out. And I don't know, can you see the speckly reflective particles moving up and around the fin? You'll see another one in a second. Here's sort of a spinning region of flow that comes back. The next movie may show it a little better. And you can sort of see some spinning, rotating fluid in here. All those motions are very important. And we can calculate the velocity of those and calculate tons of very useful things from it. So we do a lot of flow imaging um, around the fin using this laser imaging um, approach. So here's another movie of the fin kind of beating through a light sheet. Now this, this laser light sheet in blue here is coming in from the side and the fin is just beating through it. A robo fin is beating through it and we've programmed this motion. And now we'll look at it from below and see what, just to give you, I want to give you just a sense of what this looks like. So you'll see the fin beat through. So here are all these speckly reflections. The robo fin is going to come through. Can you see the fluid moving there. And so each pattern of motion of the fin produces a distinctive sort of response in the fluid. And we spend lots of time quantifying these. When you did that for the first time, were you surprised by anything that you saw? Yeah, I'm almost always surprised. Now, you could claim that means I don't learn much from my research, but I am, very much so. And we've published quite a few papers sort of describing the motion. And Yes, so I was surprised. I'll show you one, one surprising result that's, that this led us to do some experiments where we directly measure the force. And so you'll see that in a second. But absolutely, it's fluid. You'd think by now, it's 2009, everyone can just calculate all this. But you can't calculate all this. Fluid motion is extremely complicated. It's why the weather forecasts are so bad. In addition to the fact we live in New England, the weather forecasts are generally bad. The reason they're inaccurate is that um, it's very hard to calculate fluid motion. And there are lots of things that affect it. And doing it experimentally is the way to go for us. Although we've done some calculations too, yeah. Um, it seems really complicated to, to analyze that. Do you have to put your laser beam in all different angles to get the entire We do. Process? That's a very good point. And just, just actually in December, we borrowed some technology from a new company that's made a full, I'm not showing you any of that here, but it's made a full instant instantaneous 3D visualization of the flow. And so that sort of is the next thing, but it's just now being coming out. We're just working up our first results, actually. Yes, but you do. So we, we have, for this exact fin, actually, we have data like this. So we have data where we shine the laser in like that, and then we have data where we shine the laser in like that. And then you have to move it up and down the fin and sort of, you know, drink lots of coffee and try, hope you're, hopefully you reconstruct the flow in three dimensions correctly. Now we can measure the force directly with force transducers. We'll just come down to the end here with a little uh, force trace, which will show us something surprising. So this whole, this whole carriage here supports the fin, which is down here. And we can um, measure the forces on the fin. And one of the things we found is that as the fin beats, and what this is is this is a side view and a back view of a digitized motion of the fin. So you can think of that just as that movie from Behind the Fish where the fin comes out and it's cupping. So here you can see it kind of cupping. And here we see the forces produced by that fin in newtons versus time. And what you see immediately is that there are two big peaks and that the force is always positive, which means that the fish is always, when it's beating its pectoral fins like that, it's always generating positive thrust. It's never slowing itself down. And that's actually quite a trick if you think about it. If you tried to flap yourself forward in a pool with this, when you come out from the body, you think you're slowing yourself down, and then you beat back and you go forward and you go slower and then you go forward. But the fish actually doesn't. So on the outstroke, when the fin beats out, you can see we're getting a nice thrust peak here, and that's the one that comes when it beats back. They're actually synchronized if you can make your eyes blink at the right way. The outstroke in-stroke of the fin. And the fish is gener able to generate thrust on the outstroke. And this is one of the things we were able we were to see in our images of the fluid moving. And it does that in part because the fin is very flexible and it's controlled. So when the fin beats out, it's not coming out as a rigid plate. 
It's actually bending back and cupping in a way I can't make this do like this. And so it's actually pushing on the fluid, pushing back on the fluid as it comes out from the body. And so what we have here is a propulsor, a flexible propulsor that can generate a continuous thrust. And um, a lot of other types of flapping, rigid flapping like penguin wings and things like that. This trace goes down and goes negative in here. As the wings, penguin wings come down and they turn around, there's no thrust being generated at the turnaround. But they're very rigid. And this fin, as you can see, is very flexible. And it's that flexibility that allows the fin to generate this thrust all the time. OK. So we've done some fins with uh, some of these contractile polymers. Let's go back and just think about those contractile polymers now. We've built some fin designs. You asked me earlier about the time frame. So here's, I think the, the future, the distant future, is not to have to build these sort of robotic fins with individual elements that are complicated. But if you could make a whole surface just deform the way you wanted to, then you'd really be able to control things in a beautiful, even better than fish-like way. It's hard for me to conceive. But. And so here's a full fin contractile polymer. So we're going to apply some voltage. And the whole fin surface just is bending up and down. But this actually took months to get this to work right. <laughs> Because the way the current propagates through the plastic and where the eye, you know, it's just, it's, yeah, it's hard. And so that, that motion, which seemed just to take a few seconds, actually takes about a minute. And to get, it, get the charge to distribute out through the fin is challenging. But this is kind of where we're going. It'll be a few years. But it's where we're going to have whole surface deformations. I think eventually flying vehicles will have, have something similar. But this is, of course, completely silent. Now we do some robotic fish tail work. I'll just show you a few things. So here's, a, here's our test platform, our robo fish with a tail. Um, you'll see a better version of it in a second. I'll just sort of show you the fish tail moving up and down. We've got these tend getting, the, getting the tendons to control the tail that have the motors not in the water is a, kind of a trick. But we can make the tail do what we want. So here it is kind of beating up and down. You can see the tendons up there to control it. The water's going past the tendons. There's no way to avoid that. But they're kind of hidden in the body. And then my lab, oh, that's the uh, picture of the robo tail of the fish. So here's the tail. We have these three printed fin rays. So these fin rays that I described are printed on a 3D printer so we can control the flexibility and the size and the shape. Um, and then there, there's kind of a sleeve. All the tendons come down. Uh, this is what the lab looks like. Here's the tail. Here's the robo fish. It's supported on this air carriage. We have a laser light in here, a computer that controls each one of these little gauges controls the fin ray so we can move it through different arcs at different velocities. Um, high speed cameras, power supplies, yeah. everything that can go wrong does go wrong. And you can move this tail in a variety of different ways to try and get a sense for, again, how do different motions produce different amounts of force? That's, it's such a basic question, but it's for an aquatic system, we actually don't even know the answer to that yet. So how do different motions produce different forces? And so we're measuring the force. This is kind of a cupping motion. So you can see how the fin is kind of curving as opposed to a very flat motion. So it's curved down. Fish often will do that, but we don't know why they do that. This is a very flat motion where the whole tail is moving in a flat plate-like manner. This is this cupped motion. So we're able to make those motions, and we're able to measure the forces. So the force on this axis versus the frequency that we flap the fin at. And one of the things you can see is that the red triangles are higher than all the other curves, and that's this cupping motion. So when the fish is cupping the <laughs> fin out, it's actually controlling the motion of the fluid to generate more thrust than it is when it's flat. And why exactly that happens, uh, we're actually still not sure. OK, let me end and, and summarize. So we've seen some fish robots. Um, but I think that as you think of musculoskeletal systems, the, I haven't told you anything about them other than that there are a lot of them, the muscles that power the fin. But we make recordings from those muscles so we know when they're electrically active. I think you've heard about that uh, before. Um, I think the whole notion of comparative animal robotics is very exciting. There's a lot of work going on. And a lot of it's very non-immediately practical. We're just trying to figure out how animals do things. 
and then use robotic devices to help us understand that. Because the robots are actually useful for understanding the animals just the way the animals are useful for understanding the robots. It's a sort of an iterative feedback process. And I think that the two big problems in robotics are the actuators, how you move things. So we've got our big motors out of the water, and uh, it's easy for us to do things. But if you had to put the whole thing underwater, it would be more difficult. I think for humanoid types of robots, the battery power uh, and the actuators are also big issues. Your Roomba cleaner goes and docks itself and recharges, which is a great idea. But you know, if you were searching for people in, in an earthquake zone and there was rubble, the limitation for, of the time you have to search is going to be a battery power issue. And you don't want to drag long cables. I think a lot of robotics involve long cables now. And the, the, certainly the drive is to make them more autonomous. If you make them more autonomous, they also need little brains. And so the question of control, how you control the robot, is still uh, a very difficult and challenging one. And that's an area where neuroscience is interacting with robotics to try and understand what animals do, what's the simplest thing they can do, and how can we learn from that to, to control our own um, robots in the future. So I think I'll stop there and take any questions that you might have. Thanks.